Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. There are still people uh, getting on the Zoom. So I'll join you in just a couple of moments. Cheers. Well, hello everyone um, and welcome to Art Forum, wherever you are. My name is David Sequera and I'm the director of the Margaret Lawrence Gallery and I'm also the coordinator of Art Forum. And I want to begin the session um, by taking a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which you are situated. For most of us, we're in South Central Victoria, the land of um, which is which is cool and nation, but wherever you are, I ask you to join me in acknowledging that the work of artists through song, dance, painting, ritual took place here for many, many generations before us, and that these practices were intimately linked with healing, with land uh, land management, sustenance, welfare, law, and language. Our guest speaker today. Hoda Afshar is a Melbourne-based artist and scholar whose photographic practice straddles the line between staged images and reality. Through her art practice, Hoda explores, Hoda explores the nature and possibilities of documentary image making. Working across photography and moving image, Hoda considers representation of gender, marginality and displacement. In her work, she employs processes that disrupt traditional image making practices, play with the presentation of imagery, or merge aspects of conceptual staged and documentary photography. Earlier this work, uh, earlier this year, her major video work, Remain, was one of the highlights of the Lahore Biennale in Pakistan. Hoda Afshar teaches in the Master of Contemporary Art Program and the Graduate Certificate of Visual Arts Program at the VCA. Please make her welcome. Hello, hello everyone. Thanks, David. Um, uh, I would also like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nation as the um, traditional owners of this land and uh, pay my respects to their elders past, uh, present and future and also thank David and um, Art Forum for giving me this platform to share my ideas and work with you today and um, it's very um, exciting to see already 169 people joined and um, I hope you enjoy the talk. Um, as David um, said, I'm, uh, I'm a lens-based artist and my practice predominantly is with photography and in the recent years I started working with the moving image too. And for today's talk I would like to focus a little bit on um, basically the ideas that led to this process of um, what I call staging realities or like um, um, staged documentary, basically constructed documentary. Um, 
But to get there, I would also like to start by talking about um, my earlier works in Iran prior to migration. And because I see a really deep connection between the um, relationship that I built with photography and images in Iran prior to moving here and everything that I see that I do now and create now has somehow um, um, grew out of that interest and relationship. Um, I was born in Tehran af right after the Islamic Revolution in um, 1983 and in the middle of um, the war between Iran and Iraq, a war that lasted for eight years and I was born like right at the beginning of it. Um, I wasn't in the midst of the war, but the war was affecting Tehran as well and the whole country. It was a very intense period that the country after going through a revolution and that massive transition from a secular, more modern kingdom, um, quite westernized kingdom to um, uh, an extremely Islamic institution. and. Uh, and then um, it was the war that was like um, we got into. And um, when I was growing up, basically um, everything that I started learning about the past and also that new country that was shaping and forming was through the images. And it was a nostalgia for a past through the family that I was um, growing up in. Um, that like constantly like looking at the images of the country before the revolution and becoming familiar with that through those images and also realizing that um, the life that we have inside the house is very different from the one that is outside. We all had to perform this new Islamic identity and the images that we were constantly looking at, um, maybe I should share my presentation here with you. Just a second. Mm. Like uh, the images that the um, uh, national TV was constantly broadcasting was the images of the war. And also like um, this kind of like new Islamic culture and religion and um, habits and ways of being that was like being imposed or like taught to us through um, the media and photography and also the Islamic society of the, uh, the Islamic government of Iran has always had a very certain way of portraying it, itself to the outside world through the images and there was only one way of showing Iran and talking about Iran and we all knew that the way that we live can never be photographed or shared in public and even family albums I remember at least in my circle of friends and family we had to kind of like um, keep them in hidden places in case for whatever reason the house was um, uh, crushed into like they remain quite um, um, hidden because you couldn't really show like men and women hanging out together or like partying and so on. So um, like these are the images that I started making uh, throughout my travels in Iran, looking at the murals and the posters of the martyrs that always kind of like um, decorated the streets of the country, like all, all around, um, um, like what you see on the walls, it's the remaining and these uh, of these images that are kind of like form the collective uh, identity of this society and also always exist in the background, on the walls, on the television and everywhere. And they're fading out, they're broken. And um, you don't realize that they're there anymore. But for me as a migrant, after years returning to the country, I started noticing them in, and looking at them in a different way. So uh, um, every time I go back, it's an ongoing series. Um, I look for them and I document them. Uh, I remember uh, um, when I discovered photography, um, it was a tool that was giving me the opportunity and chance to document and photograph these hidden spaces and um, the way of living that we had and was never portrayed to the outside world. Because I grew up, um, also, like my teenage years was the first generation that was introduced to the satellite, the hidden satellite dishes that we were like, um, uh, people were smuggling um, into the country. And then also like people were buying it, hiding it in like their sheds. And uh, everyone was like quite fascinated after years of years of like 
having um, like this sort of like um, closed relationship with the world. No one knew what's happening in Iran and we didn't know what's happening outside. And all of a sudden there was a satellite that was showing us the outside world. Uh, so um, this, um, like, I realized through that, that the way that we Iranians are portrayed to the outside world is only this one way of like this country as an Islamic country. And I was obsessed with the idea of photographing these um, interior spaces. And uh, one of the first projects that I did at university was um, taking my camera to my friends gatherings and underground parties in Tehran and uh, documenting that and taking pictures with my friends. And uh, I knew back then that I couldn't show these images anywhere, but it was this desire to keep a record of, of what was happening. And But one thing I uh, realized from the beginning was that when, when I take this, uh, this camera in, inside these spaces, people don't act the same way um, anymore. So the camera has this sort of like, um, especially in places like that in Iran, um, uh, it's um, kind of like very similar to a weapon. You, you're you scared of um, standing in front of the camera or share those kind of like private spaces with it. But because my friends also trusted me, so we started staging a lot of the um, scenes or things that we do. And so it was like kind of like from the beginning was a collaboration between me and my friends is staging stories and narratives. Another project that I uh, wanted to show you was a work that I made in the last year of my um, uh, university studying. I don't, I think I didn't mention that I got into um, the art university in Tehran and I did my bachelor degree in uh, majoring in fine art photography. But halfway through my studying, I, uh, I realized that my passion was for storytelling and documentary. And um, uh, so I stayed focused on that. But uh, my relationship to documentary photography was through the work of many major photographers in Iran, like Kava Gulistan, Bahman Jalali, Kava Kazami, and many others, whose work are quite well known to the outside world for documenting the Islamic revolution and also the war but also like other um, social issues of the time. And, but one thing that was um, really um, a big question mark for me was the absence of the voice of female photographers. And um, also um, uh, how women look at these uh, similar issues. For example, one of the works that I was really inspired by was the work of Kaba Golestan, who photographed the prostitutes um, of Tehran. And that work is very famous in the world as well. For my final year project, I, um, I worked with a family who were really poor. And um, basically, the mother and two daughters were selling their bodies to survive. And they were living in outskirts of um, Tehran. And they built a, a room on a rooftop of an old building and they couldn't finish the building. So the, the ceiling was made of plastic and cloth. And um, they were all living in that house. And in the afternoon, the younger daughters were getting ready and putting makeup on and going out um, to find clients for the night. I spent almost a year with those guys. And um, we, um, I was kind of like, um, I don't know, like really um, interested in um, in ideas of how close you can get and basically what, how far you can go with the camera and how much you can document and so on. So a lot of these things was like with the suggestion of the girls that maybe we can restage it for you and you take your photos and you leave. And it was really scary at the time, but uh, um, I, I was young and kind of like a bit crazy too. So. Um, uh, I trusted them, they trusted me, and the clients were like, what are you doing? And we were explaining it, and they were kind of like going um, along with it. So, um, but I was also interested in looking at the other aspects of their life, and they were sort of like, um, again, like a lot of it was quite performative. I should move on quickly. And this was like the last work I made, uh, which was... Um, 
uh, me taking my camera out and looking. It was a commission by World Press Photo. I was selected as a top young photographer in Iran uh, by World Press Photo to attend the workshop with them. And I made this work for that project, which was me again looking at a side of my society that I was really unfamiliar with. Iran was after the revolution divided in two different ideological kind of groups. One was very Islamic and religious and the other one was um, kind of like more secular and, and so on. So um, I was looking at these, this religious ceremony and uh, which is held every year morning for a martyr, um, Shia Imam on the streets of Tehran and Iran everywhere. And um, one of the things that I wanted to point out about these three different works that I showed to you was the theatricality that is in, the, in all of these works and their documentary work but like uh, I didn't know back then why I'm drawn to certain kind of like topics and I make images in a certain way but later on I realized that I'm really interested in the way that people um, tend to portray themselves um, and present themselves to the camera and also the way that identity is performed outside on the streets and so on and bang um, migration happened. I moved to Australia in 2007 and um, it was um, quite a different experience. And I struggled with making images and uh, I tried for a while but the surface of the new society was very different from what I um, was used to and uh, the lack of uh, historical personal emotional connection to the new country that I moved to was um, like making it really hard for me to make documentary work. So for a period from 2007 to 2011, um, I stopped making photographs. I tried and I thought it's the end of my career as a photographer. I did a course in the sculpture and I wanted to become a sculptor and so on. And But it was also like the struggle uh, with identity and um, um, like, you face, especially if you're a migrant from a non-Western culture, coming to the West, it's like um, uh, identity is at the, like identity crisis becomes um, like um, at the heart of your experience. Um, it was all, like a lot of things, like you know, my Iranian-ness Iranian be became a name tag that I had to wear every day. It was like struggle with racism and misunderstandings and misconceptions about my identity. What I realized from the beginning was that there's an image of who I am as an Iranian woman and um, uh, as an Iranian in general, as a migrant, uh, that it, it exists in the mind of the society, that before I even get a chance to introduce myself or talk about myself, they think they know my narrative and story. So it, uh, th these questions got me into studying, uh, getting into research at university. I started a master's um, uh, by research and then I converted it to a PhD to understand this struggle basically. And what I realized was that my struggle is and a struggle against an image. And um, how, and um, so the lens of the camera turned towards myself and my own experience. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip uh, the period um, that I focused a lot on personal narratives. I presented those works, uh, probably you've seen some of them, like the images of women in veil, and um, this body of work of uh, images that I tried to, like the series I made in Iran, uh, were all kind of like an attempt to challenge ideas around uh, misrepresentation and finding a method and the staging stories and narratives to kind of mirror back to, to my audience in the West, um, like the image that they see of me and who I am. And um, it was basically looking at myself through the distorted lens of the other and trying to portray that. And um, the work that I made, for example, with the images of Islamic women was um, basically uh, like trying to challenge the audience for the um, confused image of of uh, of Muslim women that has these multiple layers of history from Orientalism up until the um, uh, the war against you know terrorism and so on, and um, it was 
it's 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 got many layers but i think i'm going to skip all of that history because i want to go back into where i started applying the same ideas to to the new projects um which kind of like this body of work behold is um my return to documentary image making and it was um where i kind of like um, understood why I was doing what I was doing back then and um, embrace that method again but this time knowing that um, uh, it came with this um, deeper knowledge of the relationship between the image maker and the subject and also how the images function in the outside world. Uh, it was in 2016 that um, I was invited by a group of young homosexual men that I know and I'm really close to, to go into this secret bathhouse with them that existed for, uh, according to them, more than 40 years. And it was the only um, public space where these people could um, actually openly explore their sexuality and be who they are and they always taught me about this place and they invited me to photograph them there but to me it was almost impossible for a woman to go into a male only bathhouse and uh, with a camera also to make pictures they took me there and they were like we will take you inside and magically it happened like the owner said yes if you pay for the day we close down the doors I'll get my staff to come and contribute to the project and um, you guys do whatever you want to do there. I had only my analog camera with me and also like um, 10 rolls of film. I was shocked, I was scared, not knowing if it's safe for me to go in, but I was presented with this incredible scenario and an excited group of friends who wanted me to take their photos in there. Um, one of the um, um, uh, writers, theorists that really influenced my way of thinking about this work and the future work that, um, that I will show you is um, Jacques Rancière and his ideas around the politics of aesthetic and aesthetic as politics. He says politics revolves around what is seen and what can be said about it, around who has the ability to see and the talent to speak around the properties of space and the possibilities of time. Uh, for Rancia, politics itself is always an aesthetic phenomenon. And in this sense, um, that involves the struggle of an unrecognized group of uh, people to become seen and heard. Uh, politics as aesthetic is a struggle for equal recognition and um, this means confronting the sensible order. By sensible order, Rancia means what is um, sayable, what is audible and what is visible. Through understanding um, his ideas on this, um, um, like what is politics, which was really interesting for me, was um, like basically this is a struggle with visibility. One of the things that um, I'm really interested in as an artist is, um, is how we can disrupt this process by changing the way um, and how we see the world and um, how, um, you know, what, what has become norm to us and acceptable is what, uh, what has been made visible. And like, for example, like a simple example of it, which I was recently thinking about, during this pandemic is that all we hear all the time is what's happening in America. And I turn the news on and every day that there's these kind of like detailed re um, reports on um, what's going on in America and or mostly like London and Germany and here and there, but no one talks about what's happening in South Africa at the moment, that people are starving. There's a certain way of showing what's happening in Iran, but like the, why we're not questioning every day what's happening in Yemen. And it's just because of like the norm is to us what is more visible and who's got the platform to be seen and heard. So um, I started thinking about image making as as a, as, an, as a rebellious act to kind of like subvert the very power system that uses 
images to normalize certain way of um, being and also give value to a certain um, group of people by making them visible, visible in a certain way and then deny the others the same rights and uh, recognition. So this work was something that made me think a lot about these ideas and um, like make, give visibility to those unseen uh, and hidden spaces and bodies. When I showed this work here in 2000 and I think 17 at um, the um, Center for Contemporary Photography for the first time, um, I decided to not disclose the location of this work because I didn't want the beauty and intimacy of these bodies and the value of the work to be reduced to this controversial idea of like the geographical, polit uh, the politics of its geography. I wanted people to look at them um, through their own kind of experiences and, um, uh, and not to reduce them to kind of like um, the geography that they come from. And it was at the same time that we were here voting for gay marriage. And the fact that it was still a question mark here meant that we, um, that, you know, there's no um, kind of like difference in that sort of judgment. So um, this is a view um, installation shot of the work at CCP. Um, I later on showed it at many different places. And like, for example, one of the um, experiences was that I showed it at Horsham um, Gallery and um, uh, the gallery, um, uh, one of, uh, yeah, the director told me later that um, um, a priest came to the gallery and started yelling at them and saying that my family came to see this show. Do you think we really need to see these images in public spaces? And um, one of the people at the gallery looks at him and says, if there were images of naked women, you wouldn't have asked the same question, right? So that's exactly... Um, um, is what I what I'm trying to say in terms of what is normalized to us and um, I, I think we need to produce more images of these kind of like um, basically like the majority of the struggles that we have is with visibility so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use um, photography as a tool to kind of like mass produce images of what has been made um, invisible for centuries. I want to move to the next um, project of mine. Um, just want to quickly look at how much time I have. Um, you're doing all right, I think. Um, uh, the next project I want to share with you is the work that probably many of you have seen remain that I made with a group of um, refugees who were detained on Manus Island at the, at the time. Um, it was in 2018 that I traveled to Manus Island. Uh, like the work that I made um, with uh, in Behold uh, got me also really interested in this idea of bare life and what Giorgio Agamben, um, which is um, an Italian scholar uh, who talks about and this sort of like bare life as um, citizens who are um, stripped of basic human rights. And um, like when I was researching those ideas, um, I became interested, um, uh, more and more interested in, um, um, uh, in the issue of like the refugee crisis. And uh, because a lot of my work deals with um, issues to do with marginality and understanding why certain people and group of people are pushed to the margins of the society. And the refugee to me is the ultimate marginal subject. And uh, I'm also interested like by using uh, photography and camera, I'm actually trying to first like um, understand the matter, look closely as the ma at the matter and try to study and understand it. And the outcome, whatever I make is um, 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 what I would like to share with others. So it was at this, around the same time that I was thinking about these issues that um, the, uh, the Australian government decided to close um, the offshore detention centers on Manus Island after four and a half years of basically caging 1400 men um, in the tropical heat in one space and um, 
um, leave them um, and relocate them to new facilities on the island, which meant that they will remain on Manus Island indefinitely. And um, I was familiar with the writings of Behrouz Bouchani, which is an Iranian Kurdish um, um, refugee who was writing extensively from Manus Island for, for publications like Guardian and Pan America, all around, like uh, he was getting a lot of exposure and I was reading, um, following his writing. But um, it was at that time that on the news, I saw these men sitting there begging Australia to let them go and uh, free them from that, um, um, that place. So I saw Barrows Bouchani on television. It was like a really shocking um, experience that um, I can't even describe um, how it made me feel. And I, um, because my father was a Kurdish man too, and um, there was a kind of like a familiar uh, sense of familiarity in Barrows's face and like a sense of responsibility there's kind of like uh, a grad of like a really genuine um concern basically that made me think what can i do to to help because behrouz was struggling with english and um, i thought you know as an artist i have a small platform and i can actually speak his language i can get in contact with him and see what i can do so uh, there's this quote that I always share from John Berger that um, um, kind of stayed with me when I read it for the first time. He says, this is what happens when you see a violent photograph. First shock, the other suffering engulfs you, then either despair or indignation. If despair, you take on some of the others suffering to no purpose. If indignation, you decide to act. And I always wondered, what does it take for people to act? And uh, what can be, what, what's going on that like there are all these images that are coming out of, for example, Manus and Nauru, images of refugees um, suffering, crying behind the bars in a cage, begging, waiting, and why nothing changes anymore? What, ha what happened to us that we became immune to the images of suffering? Um, what I realized was that like, um, you know, first, firstly, it's just like um, somehow portraying refugees or people um, of any sort of like minority groups as like the way that we often tend to do and tradition of photography does is that they never rise above um, that inferior status and basically showing them in the way that we often do um, is a way to justify their position as like why they that why they're there basically. It's just thinking about them as uh, people who are basically fleeing war or um, sort of like um, uh, persecution and so on, and uh, all they seek is safety and nothing else. And we've given them safety and food in a cage, and they should be happy and so on or like the way that our systems and governments represent them to us um, through these images is that uh, they're either extremely dehumanized or like portrayed as dangerous, like dangerous people because they come from certain places that are often portrayed as dangerous terrorists and so on. And they, they um, resemble um, a kind of a threat to the sanctity of our societies. So this is a method, um, a very well thought out method by these systems that um, are being kind of like used to justify the um, barbaric way of, um, of treating um, refugees um, specifically, which is something that Georgia Gambon talks a lot about, like the state of exception, for example, is where all these progressive democratic systems and societies can actually let go of all of those ethics and morality and rule of uh, uh, kind of like social contract that um, took us years but it just becomes like sort of like very specific to certain privileged um, uh, civilians and uh, we deny the same right to the ones that we place outside our borders so um, I decided to go to Manus Island and understanding all these kind of like issues, 
I was thinking how I can challenge these uh, modes of representation and how I can um, create images that can make people um, see the humanity of these individuals and see them as equal to themselves, not um, anything less. I made two bodies of work there, which was one was um, a video installation, a two-channel video installation. The work is um, made again, and it's very performative. There's a lot of singing and narration by different individuals. That It's made on Manus Island. One of the things that stood out to me at the, from the beginning was the lushness of the island and it was like a paradise it was it was one of the most beautiful tropical islands i've ever seen and the extreme beauty of it as opposed to the extreme pain and trauma that these individuals were um sharing with me was the most um jarring experience i can't even describe it was like the most disturbing experience and that's what i realized i want to bring into the work not to portray um, like um, it, just being in a cage or behind bars doesn't um, uh, portray this idea of like imprisonment and um, nature can turn into a prison. And the fact that, for example, at, at a point, uh, Behrouz Bouchani in the film calls this beautiful island that is sacred to, to all the locals a green hell. And he says, um, refugees hate the color green. We are sick of seeing the color green. And they call it a green hell. Made me think um, to what level a human being can be tortured and traumatized to see nature as, as a um, place of torture. Like the film starts with this uh, beautiful waterfall and you're looking at it. And then the first thing you hear is um, that Behrouz talks about a refugee who died in, um, in this place. And you realize you're looking at a side of trauma. The work is dedicated to um, 12 um, refugees who died on Manus and Nauru since the start of uh, um, these offshore detention camps there through um, either suicide or murder by the guards or, um, you know, like illness and lack of medical support there. So um, it was also um, a series of portraits that we made together. Like the process that I used was, um, we were, Behrouz was helping to get six refugees out every day from, from the detention um, center. And uh, we were putting them on a boat and one of the locals of uh, Manus Island offered us a place in his little island, which was like a little bit outside Manus him and his family of 25 were living on that island and he was so generous with his time and help that was welcoming us there, picking us up from Manus, taking us to his island because it was the only safe place for us to work. And we didn't have anyone to stalk us like the immigration officers and so on. So we were making food, cooking there together. And um, I was talking to them individually. They were sharing these stories with me. And then we were deciding how to portray that. I made a series of portraits. On the right side, you see the family of Robin who helped me to set up a studio in the island. And on the left, you see Bevis Bichani and his friends as my as the team of directors. <laughs> and they were helping me um, um, to make the work. Basically, all the portraits were made in collaboration together. And like, for example, this is a little video I wanna show you to see the process. Um, I don't know if you can hear the sound. Um, I don't know if I turn the sound on. I hope you can. Um, yeah, it was like very theatrical, the whole process. Like, um, for example, that's one of the images that we made with water. And what I tried to do uh, was to, like, the question was how we can make this the passive image of a refugee, how we can break that and how we can 
create images that are like um, activated somehow. And so a lot of the, um, like the, just a second. Um, I couldn't hear the sound. Okay. Um, I'll sh stop sharing at some point and share again. Uh, yes, the portraits were, um, like uh, I was asking them to choose one um, natural element from, from the island that they think represents their emotions and feelings best. And uh, for example, the um, portrait on the right is a dress which um, his portrait turned out glary and it's quite ironic because um, he chose the chicken and the chicken is a bird that cannot fly and he said the chicken represents a freedom for me that doesn't exist and I can't even imagine um, how freedom feels and he was like a, the youngest person in the uh, refugee camps he arrived at the age of 18 he, he he's in a stateless Kurdish refugee and uh, at that time he was 24 and um, so when when I developed the film and I realized his portrait turned out blurry, it kind of like uh, represented a story, like this idea of like um, um, a freedom that never existed for him. Or um, water or, um, yeah, there are lots of stories, but I probably can't share them all here with you. And, um, and that's the portrait of Beres Buchani, uh, which many of you probably have seen and um, won the bonus photography prize in 2018 and helped us a lot to um, bring the um, attention of a broader um, audience to, to the um, horrors of the detention camps on Manus and Nauru. Behrouz is, by the way, now in New Zealand, awaiting his... Um, refugee status. He was interviewed and um, we're hoping that he will get his freedom soon. Uh, the last work I want to share with you is um, a work that I'm uh, is now, um, I'm in the making of it. I was commissioned by Photo 2020 Festival, which is now called Photo 2021, to make um, a work for a public site in the city uh, for the festival. And um, this again like grew out of my um, interest in the previous work and um, it's a work that I made in collaboration with um, uh, with a group of uh, with a number of whistleblowers in Australia this time I decided to turn the camera inwardly and look at my um, um, close environment and think about um, how the same sort of modes of thinking is affecting um, Australian people themselves. And um, the, the idea first began by, by realizing that people who worked, the Australians who worked on Manus Island and Nauru, um, they were telling me that like, they were not allowed to share with public what they're witnessing there. And if they talked about it, they were facing jail time and um, they were losing their job. They were never allowed to work in any governmental institutions and so on. So I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that in a democratic system, liberal democratic system, such things can exist basically. So I started investigating that. And um, so for this project, I, um, again, I'm working with moving image and photography. And um, I'm looking, I'm using the language of documentary in hiding identities of people basically like when when they can't reveal the identity there's always these really close croppings and and so on for the video i'm using that aesthetic and um the whistleblowers are all uh, people who work across different uh, governmental organizations from disability care to youth um justice centers and uh uh, offshore onshore detention camps um, to the army and ASIO and many different um, governmental organizations and um, it's so interesting that we did a series of interviews with each and every one of them and the stories arrives at the same point like um, that it's just these individuals who are facing like seeing governments and systems wrongdoing and they're 
struggling a lot with um, their own sense of morality and ethics to a point that they realize that they can't cope with that anymore and the public should know. So they risk everything. Everything means like they, um, the stories that they shared about their lives is like, first they lost their jobs. They were threatened all the time by the system. They were take, threatened by jail time, taken to the court. At some point, they go through a lot of anxiety and depression. They lose their marriage. They lose their family and friends. And um, they go to the media, and the media exposes the narrative to the public. But what they realize at the end is um, that the public chooses to remain blind to it. So when I heard all these stories, um, it made me think of, um, you know, Greek tragedy um, and how... Uh, Greek, in Greek tragedies, the main figure is always uh, the, uh, um, the tragic figure is the one who's standing between um, morality and the law. And um, at the end, um, they lose everything. Like um, the, the, um, the tragic figure is the one that fights for the public, fights for the morality against the system and loses everything. For, for making this work, I was thinking, how can I this time use photography to make people invisible? Because to be a whistleblower means that the only way to speak out is to um, hide your identity. Um, and um, so it was a kind of a reverse methodology and also like uh, how I was acknowledging that the struggle with visibility uh, for minority groups is very different with the struggle that we have here. In fact, like in Western societies now, our struggle is more about um, how to become invisible. We are surrounded by surveillance and so on. So I tried to use the same, um, again, like language of the system to subvert the very power systems that try to control it. I worked with a, um, um, with a 3D um, um, scanning expert. He, he's got this studio that he's got 110 cameras set up that fires at the same time. So I wanted it to be in one click, like how we normally capture portraits. Um, the subjects were sitting there and uh, we were making up. This is a test that I did on myself at first. So the image is taken um, into this 3D scanning space. Like these 110 cameras, they record all the details of your body and face and head and everything. But then you will take it into, um, uh, let me stop this. Then you will take it into the um, 3D scanning space. What I was trying to, um, uh, trying to do was to create portraits that resembles these um, Greek kind of like a statues um, as a way of referencing Greek tragedy that I was earlier talking about. What is so interesting for me is um, um, the only thing that the 3D um, scanning process cannot record is the details of the eye. And for me, like looking at the eyes of these statues also, I wanted to have kind of like a similar sort of uh, resemblance to that. And also like the absence of the eye is a way of removing the identity, but also uh, to reflect that idea of the blindness, the active blindness of the society. So um, this is like a 3D model of the head that, uh, for example, of one of the subjects that we made. And, um, and then later I tried, this is um, an image of a 3D print of the statue that I made. At this stage, I'm, I'm going to use, like in each process, one layer is removed. So what I'm trying to do um, at this stage um, uh, is uh, there's still two more processes to go with. The, the project is not finished yet. Um, and two more processes to remove two more layers of the identity. Um, I think I'm gonna wrap here and um, sorry, I'm looking, oh, you can see the chat box that I open here, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just um, trying to look at the messages. Um, I'm going to wrap it here by reading you the conclusion that I wrote, like a little um, 
comment about my relationship to image making um, and why am I drawn to images? Um, to me, there's something in images, maybe um, their proximity to the real world that captures the nature of the political. By political, I mean the struggle for visibility, equality um, and recognition. Images have a dawn nature, something whose impact is even more immediate than text. Images are open to being read while being at the same time psychologically piercing. They have the ability to draw people in and make them care about a matter. If the image is merely an abstraction of reality that is open to being read, then it's not politically engaging. Or if it's only about identifying the intensity of a political matter, like any other works of identity politics, that simply points to the issue, then they may be open to being what I find most um, being read, but definitely not open to causing change. What I find most powerful about images is their ability to bring those two things together. They can draw people in through aesthetic or familiarity and closeness to the real world without being didactic. So there can be an openness to the way we read them. They can create a space for us in which to meditate on, to meditate on and negotiate the most urgent issues of our time. How can we unmake and unlearn what we know and change our reality towards a fairer and more equal world through images? I'd like to leave that question for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hoda. Like, thank you for such incredible generosity and taking us, not only letting us into your home, but uh, taking us through your thought process and the, the sorts of ideas and um, commitments that you have that, you know, there's for me, the thing that I left with is that there's no separation between all of those thoughts and your um, studio practice. So thank, thank you. you. We've got time for one question and I'm gonna hand over to Nicholas Pierce. Um, Nick, if you could ask that question, please. Yeah, I'm gonna ask that question on behalf of Kiara Shazangene. Um, hi, do you believe artists can manipulate social sculpture and eventually contribute to a big change in humanity? If um, yes, how can we measure that? Uh, what do you mean exactly by social sculpture? I, I, think, I, think, I think actually what he means is, um, I, I think he was social structure. Like, can artists make a difference to a social structure? Um, I, I do believe that, and I think um, uh, I don't believe in radical changes, and I believe that the change can happen in the small fractions. And um, like, for example, this was proven to me through the work that I made with with the refugees. It was um, a really um, uh, before that I was quite cynical um, whether whether art can contribute to change at all, but the impact that the work had on the issue and the recognition to the voice of the people who were suffering there was beyond what I even could imagine. So um, I think those little steps that you take and um, what, what has been constructed, what has taken the imperial system and col colonial power systems to build up um, in centuries and centuries cannot be dismantled with one or two works of art. It probably takes um, a much longer period of resistance and a struggle for us and the production of images that give visibility to those um, misrepresented voices and also absent voices. Um, yeah, it's going to take us time, but it can happen. It's just we have to mass produce it. Hoda, that's really all we've got time for, but I can't thank um, you enough for... Um, you know, Did I go all the time? I'm so sorry. No, there's nothing for you to apologise for. It was an incredibly rich, um, a really rich kind of conveying of all of your thoughts. Oh, so thank you. thank you so much for joining us in Art Forum. Thank you to my colleague, Nick Pierce, And uh, thank you to everyone from around the globe who joined us for Art Forum. We will be back at 12.30 next Thursday. Thank you. Thank everybody. you for having me. Thanks for listening. Thanks a lot. Okay. See ya. Bye. 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 Bye.